closer to the university. <coughs> and on each time, I had seen it go and develop beyond recognition into a dream campus. The subject of my talk is freedom, responsibility, and accountability of the Indian media. Freedom here is used in the sense of the media being able to function freely without unduly restrictive laws, as well as threats and pressures from the state and from other sources. Responsibility here is a moral virtue or moral responsibility to advance the public good. Accountability refers to being subject to the judgment of an external agency that can penalize what it sees as transgressions. I will elaborate on these three concepts in relation to the Indian media in due course, but first the context, the state of the Indian media. India is one of the largest media markets in the world with over 70,000 registered newspapers in various languages, 1,600 cable television stations, and 384 million active internet users. According to the Indian Leadership Survey 2019, which is the latest, 39% of the people read newspapers, 77% watch television, and 24% access the internet. While elsewhere, the digital revolution has seen newspaper circulations drop sharply, India is one of the few markets where with growing literacy and incomes, print readership is also growing. And according to the survey, newspaper readership between 2017 and 2019 grew from 407 million to 425 million. While the Indian media market is diverse and offers a wide range of news and opinion, the digital revolution is fast catching up. This would have three major consequences. First, the traditional business model in which Advertising used to pay for quality journalism <coughs> that could be brought to their readers at a relatively low price <laughs> is collapsing with advertising moving online and to television. Newspapers and television stations are still groping to find a viable business model for online publications. <coughs> business publications online have been successful in paying getting readers to pay for their content, and a few general newspapers, such as the New York Times, have launched commercially viable online editions behind paywalls. While the Indian media market is still growing, it is a question of maybe five years or so before the global trend catches up and a new quest for a viable business model for journalism will begin. Here, there are very few models abroad to copy from. Secondly, with the growing use of the internet and with the spread of smartphones <coughs> across the country, including the rural areas, the way people access news is fast changing. <coughs> Mobile phones are increasingly becoming the points of access for news and entertainment. The use of artificial intelligence and algorithms to direct people's search and to convey content to them over the internet and mobile apps may well lock people into their own preferences and echo chambers, diminishing the value of diversity of media. Thirdly, the growing use of the social media has been a force for the good in that it has democratized access to the media and a wide range of news and entertainment. Yet, the proliferation of online content and the absence of gatekeeping have enabled the rapid spread of even fake news and the planting of stories that could shape public opinion and even determine electoral outcomes. Fake news that could spark violence and conflict among different villages 
caste or the ethnic groups has been a matter of concern in India as well. In response to such concerns, social media companies have agreed to take down news found objectionable on specific and valid grounds. So much for the context. Let me now turn to the first of the three areas of discussion, namely freedom. Freedom of expression generally and media freedom in particular have both intrinsic and instrumental values. Henry David Thoreau in a search for solitude found little use for the newspaper and he expressed his attitude most eloquently in Walden and I quote, if we read of one man robbed or murdered or killed by accident, he wrote, or one house burnt, or one vessel wrecked, or one steamboat blown up, or one cow run over by the Western Railroad, or one mad dog killed, or one lot of grasshoppers in the winter, <coughs> we never read to read of another. One is enough. <laughs> Yet in democratic societies, the value of media and of freedom of expression is obvious. The intrinsic value of freedom of expression <coughs> lies in enabling self-expression and the development of the individual to have full potential. Its instrumental value comprises first democratic deliberation and free discussions of various ideas and opinions and arriving at informed decisions. This is also described in metaphysical terms by Milton and John Stuart Mill, as all utterances true or false being allowed in the conviction that truth will always triumph over <laughs> falsehood. We know this is not always true. The second instrumental value is what is called the checking value of free speech. Free media is expected to speak truth to power and act as a check against abuse of power, corruption, and insensitivity to public needs. Expose of corruption, as for instance in the Bofors deal in which the Hindu played a major part, all of the blinding of under trials <coughs> in a prison in Bihar, reported by the Indian Express, bring out the value of media freedom in the Indian context. Free media also ensures prompt public action in dealing with emergencies and public suffering. In the Nobel laureate Amartya Sen has this to say about the role of media. India has not had a famine since independence and given the nature of Indian politics and society, it is not likely that India can have a famine even in years of great food problems. The government cannot afford to fail to take prompt action when large-scale starvation threatens. Newspapers play an important part in this in making the facts known and forcing the challenge to be faced. That is Amartya Sen on the value of newspapers in making the government responsible to, responsive to public needs. A third instrumental value of free speech lies in its mission to educate people and also to provide entertainment. Then coming to media freedom in India. In my view, the India, Indian media is substantially <coughs> free, though there are specific concerns. Views could vary even substantially, and let me just cite three external agencies. The Press Freedom NGO, <coughs> Reporters Without Borders, ranks India 148th among 180 countries in its 2019 Press Freedom Rankings. This ranking places India among countries where the situation is said to be difficult. According to the RSF, there are concerns about practical impunity for the killing of journalists. Six journalists were killed in 2018. Attacks on the social media, on journalists, particularly women journalists writing stories critical of the ruling establishment, 
abuse of laws relating to criminal defamation and sedition and difficulties that the media faces in Kashmir and other disturbed areas. Freedom House, another free speech NGO, describes the Indian media as partly free. The U.S. State Department classifies India among countries with political and media freedom, though it also lists some specific concerns. Turning to the legal framework of media freedom in India, we find that Article 191A of the Constitution guarantees all citizens shall have the right to freedom of speech and expression. At this point, three conditions need to be noted. First, the guarantee of free speech is to all citizens and does not extend to non-citizens. Second, it speaks of the right to freedom of speech and expression and not specifically of press freedom. On the other hand, the First Amendment of the American Constitution states, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. However, the Supreme Court of India has interpreted this article as guaranteeing the freedom of the press in full as well. In addition to free speech, press freedom or media freedom includes the commercial or business right to print and to circulate newspapers. It includes, for instance, access to printing equipment and newsprint and the right to carry on the business of publishing <coughs> and determine how many pages are to be printed and sold at what price. A third distinction is a practical one between the freedom allowed to the print media and to the broadcast media. Broadcast media functions under a much more restrictive legal framework than print in that it is subject to content codes and to advertising codes and may be subject to action including fines and being pulled off the air. The Supreme Court has upheld such restrictions basically on two grounds. The first is a rationale applied earlier to film censorship free censorship of films, that is, that the audiovisual medium has a more direct and immediate impact than cold print. The Supreme Court went on to say it, that is television, is a powerful instrument which can be used for greater good as also for doing immense harm to society. The second reason for the more restrictive approach to broadcasting is one that is found in other countries as well, that broadcasting uses scarce radio frequency spectrum and in licensing and regulating the use of radio waves, the government will lay down, may lay down conditions under which they could be used. The right guaranteed under Article 191A is subject to restrictions that are specified also in Article 19.2. And it says the state might make law introducing restrictions, reasonable restrictions on the exercise of the right in the interest of sovereignty and integrity of India, security of state, friendly relations with foreign states, public order, decency or morality, or in relation to contempt of court, defamation or incitement to an offense. Any restriction to pass the test of constitutionality has first to be imposed by a law and not by executive fear or arbitrary exercise of executive power. Secondly, it has to be reasonable. Reasonable is a term that is often at the center of contention and challenges to restrictions on speech. Generally, to be reasonable, a restriction has to be compatible with the standards of a democracy or the democratic norms. It has to be narrowly tailored to a specific case and not be overbroad. And it has to be proportional to the likely harm caused by the speech. 
Thirdly, a restriction is allowed on the eight grounds specified in article, the article, and not otherwise. Among the grounds, public order, sovereignty and integrity of India and decency and morality have been the ones invoked most often to justify legal restrictions. In interpreting what restriction is reasonable and could be allowed, there have been two kinds of approaches. The first is to consider free speech as a separate and dominant value and examine if any restriction is necessary and reasonable. The second approach involves balancing individual right of free speech with the interests of society, prevention of harm, protecting the rights of others, including the right to reputation, primacy of some state interests, including national security and fair trial, and even protecting the values that a society might consider vital. The balancing approach of different rights with free speech generally leads to a more restrictive approach. The standard by which speech was to be judged was, was enunciated by Justice Vivian Bose as early as in 1947 and endorsed later by the Supreme Court. And they quote that the effect of words must be judged from the standards of reasonable, strong-minded, firm and courageous men, and not those of weak and vacillating minds, nor of those who scent danger in every hostile point of view. This is the latitude that is supposed to be allowed to free speech in considering any restriction, in examining any, whether any restriction is constitutionally valid or not. Despite such constitutional and judicial guarantees, some serious concerns remain on laws and their enforcement. One of the laws most commonly invoked against journalists and media organizations is Section 499 of the Indian Penal Code on Criminal Defamation, which makes it Punishable, criminal defamation is punishable with imprisonment up to two years and with fine. It also lists ten exceptions. Among them, truth that the public good requires to be published, public conduct of public servants, substantially true reports of court proceedings, opinion on the merits of public performances, and so on. It's interesting that truth per se is not a defense, it must be shown that it needed to be published for the public good. It is difficult to see how publication of truth cannot be for the public good unless it relates to, say, a person's medical information or personal family information or where there could be a reasonable expectation of privacy. In practice, very few journalists or media houses have been convicted under this section, but the process of trial itself is very burdensome. A journalist or an editor can be summoned to appear before a magistrate in any corner of the country, and usually one personal appearance is mandatory. In fact, as one who at one point face no less than 20 criminal defamation cases. I can tell you how distracting it could be. <coughs> the trial itself drags on and hangs for many years over the journalist's head. The very threat of criminal defamation leads to self-censorship and inhibits vigorous journalism, particularly investigative journalism and holding public officials to account. International standards of freedom of expression adopted among other organizations by UNESCO call for decriminalization of defamation and treating defamation as a civil wrong. Criminal defamation is regarded as disproportionate to the offense and inhibiting free media from functioning effectively. A challenge in the Supreme Court that the criminal defamation law was an unreasonable restriction on freedom of speech 
guaranteed in the Constitution failed in 2015. The Supreme Court held that freedom of expression had to be balanced against the right of a person to reputation and a life of dignity that is also a fundamental right. In its view, the section of the Indian Penal Code on criminal defamation, read with the exceptions, strikes a reasonable balance between freedom of speech and the right to reputation. With the route to the court closed for the time being, the only way out seems to be the legislative route to amend the law. In this connection with def defamation and truth, the latitude needed for functioning for free press was recognized by Justice Bremen in New York Times versus Sullivan, which said if a strict rule requiring the proof of everything that is written might lead to self censorship. Allowance of the defense of truth with burden of proving it on the defendant does not mean that only false speech will be deterred. And as such a rule, would be critics of official conduct may be deterred from voicing their criticism, even though it is believed to be true, and even though it is in fact true, because of the doubt whether it can be proved in court or of the fear of expense of having to do so. The Supreme Court of India had moved to a similar position in one case involving the state of Tamil Nadu. Public officials in a democracy need to be subject to close and rigorous scrutiny. It is not possible unless the press is allowed a greater latitude. The ideal standard again was laid down by the U.S. Supreme Court in New York Times versus Sullivan, which said, a federal rule that prohibits a public official from recovering a, da a defamatory <coughs> falsehood relating to his official conduct unless he proves that the statement, statement was made with actual malice, that is, with knowledge that it was false, or with the reckless disregard of whether it was true or false. This again was the standard adopted by the Indian Supreme Court as well. Traditionally, the, per the person making a publication has to show that what, it was, what was published was true. Under the Sullivan standard, in the case of public officials, the burden of proof is reversed, and the public official has to show that the publication was made maliciously, all with reckless disregard for the truth. This was a standard that, as I said, was adopted by the Indian Supreme Court as well. But in practice, this is hardly ever followed by the lower courts or even by the high courts. Another problem area for the media is the law of contempt of court. That is among the most restrictive among constitutional democracies. Most countries impose some restrictions on discussing matters before the court on the ground that for a fair trial, legal issues had to be determined within the court after hearing the parties, that confidence in the judicial process would be undermined if formal proceedings are carried on outside, and that the parties and others ought not to influence the course of justice one way or the other by their actions outside the court. The concern is that a public discussion of issues before the court might influence the jury or the judge and inhibit the party. Under the Contempt of Courts Act in India, a publication that prejudices or interferes or tends to interfere with the due course of any judicial proceeding would add, add amount to contempt. This bar on discussing an ongoing trial applies from the early stage of a complaint or when a charge sheet is filed to the final disposal of appeals. The 
the sub judici rule in india is interpreted strictly to prohibit any discussion of issues before the court even if they are engaging the public attention the jury system no longer exists in india and the courts are manned by professional judges who are trained not to be influenced by comments and happenings outside the court yet on the supposition that a comment comment or remark outside the court could possibly prejudice the trial and somehow justice a silence is decreed on the media in relation to all pending cases it's interesting that even countries with a jury system do not impose such severe restrictions on media reporting of pending cases then there is then the offense of uh, again at the contempt of court there is the offense of scandalizing the court defined as any publication that scandalizes or tends to scandalize or lowers the authority of any court the words themselves lend lend to an endless variety of interpretation and there is a persisting uncertainty over what might or might not be regarded as contempt as scandalizing the court let me give you just two illustrations to show how the contempt of court law is as justice krishna here one of the great indian jurists described is a vague and wandering jurisdiction you might know the writer andrati roy has been involved in uh, courts where many issues dealing with in the courts she was once issued a notice for contempt in connection with a demonstration she had joined in front of the supreme court in protest against the judgment in the nagmada case and she said in her affidavit filed in the court that the contempt case indicates a disquieting inclination on the part of the court to silence criticism and muzzle dissent to harass and intimidate those who agree or disagree with it she went on to tell the court in an affidavit by entertaining a petition based on an fir that even a local police station does not seem fit to act upon the supreme court is doing its own reputation and credibility considerable harm she went on to demand a greater accountability from the judiciary and added a judicial dictatorship is as fearsome a prospect as a military dictatorship or any other form of totalitarian rule for this uh, statement filed in an affidavit to the court the court held the statement was, was amounted to contempt of court and sentenced her to one day's imprisonment at a fine of 2000 rupees interestingly 3 years earlier a three judge bench of the supreme court had found a similar attack on the court not to be content alindra tiroy again had in an article mocked the supreme court's order and the payment of compensation to tribals displaced by the narmada project project and added most tribal people or let's say most small farmers have as much use for money as a supreme court judge has for a bag of fertilizer after disapproving uh, remarks the majority in the bench hearing the nomada case concluded we are of the opinion in the larger interests of issues pending before us that we need not pursue the matter further because of the built in unfairness in the contempt case where the court acts as judge jury and hangman rolled into one and judges are judging their own cause courts have been enjoined to exercise due care in contempt of court cases until recently even truth which should triumph for all other considerations was no defense to a charge of contempt it was only in 2006 following the working of the, the following the recommendations of the national commission to review the working of the constitution 
that the contempt of court fact was amended to provide the defense of justification by truth. The larger issue is whether the offense of scandalizing the court should remain on the statute book at all. The notion that any institution should be above criticism <coughs> and that the dignity and authority of judges need to be upheld by shielding them from normal scrutiny and critical remarks is corrosive of democratic values. The rationale that public trust in the judiciary would somehow be shaken by public criticism reflects poorly on the strength and confidence of the judiciary whose authority has to rest on, on its obvious fairness and quality of its judgment. As is, the general, as is the general rule in the United States, any curbs could be confined to the parties before the court and their behavior in and outside the court. Indeed, it's ironic that in India, the judiciary has been the <coughs> staunchest defender of press freedom and media rights. And it, the press itself faces some difficult times from the judiciary itself. Another area of concern is the privilege to punish for contempt conferred on legislatures. The Constitution of India confers on Parliament and the state legislatures the same privileges that the British House of Commons had at the time of Indian independence. The British House of Commons has in fact done away with most of the privileges, but parliaments in India and in the state legislatures do have such powers to punish for contempt. Parliament at the center, the federal parliament, has not used the power to punish for contempt, but many of the state legislatures have done so. In fact, in the state of Tamil Nadu, where I come from, there have been two dramatic instances of the abuse of the power to punish for contempt of the legislature. One for printing a cartoon which showed members of the assembly in a poor light and the other for critical remarks made against the functioning of the state legislature. Another law that is often invoked with reference to speech is sedition. The old colonial era section of the Indian Penal Code deals with sedition or affecting disloyalty to the government or disaffection to the government. While the law courts have however reiterated that while the law the Law is overbroad, the Supreme Court has held, and I quote, a citizen has a right to say or write whatever he likes about the government or its measures by way of criticism or comment, so long as he does not incite people to violence against the government established by law or with the intention of creating public disorder. Yet the sedition law has continued to be invoked against well-known dissidents. Among those charged with sedition include <coughs> Arundhati Roy for advocating plebiscite in Jammu and Kashmir, Simran Jit Singh Man for advocacy of Khalistan, Praveen Togadia for distributing trishuls, and Kanaya Kumar and Kanaya Kumar for anti-national slogans during a demonstration. We then have hate speech laws which prohibit speech likely to cause disharmony among different sections of religious caste or regional sections. Then we have an omnibus blasphemy law which prohibits uh, blasphemy against any religion, not part any particular religion but against all religions. India is unique in the sense that 
It doesn't privilege any religion in this matter, but imposes an omnibus restriction on blasphemy. The legal provisions, in fact, represent negative liberty. What about positive liberty, the right to access to information? In India, the Right to Information Act passed in 2005 makes access to information a right rather than a freedom. It's not a freedom of information law, it's a right to information in the sense that if any government agency denies that information, it's uh, subject to penalties. Times, newspapers or television stations could indulge in what are called what is called subterfuge in terms in the way of sting operations to uncover the truth. In fact, in one case, very interestingly, by a sting operation by NDTV revealed that in a particular high-profile trial, the BMW trial, as it was called. <coughs> The defense lawyer and the prosecutor were both acting in league to influence a particular witness. And this was revealed by the sting operation by ND Television. And when this was taken to the Supreme Court by the defense, the Supreme Court said that what NDTV did served a very important public cause and it was well within its uh, well. It was in order that it should have done so. Most recently, the case of Rafael papers that involved publication of information and material obtained from the Defense Ministry, the Supreme Court observed that the fact that the three documents had been published in the Hindu and were thus available to the public domain has not been disputed. Then it says, in fact, the publication of said documents in the Hindu newspaper reminds the court of the consistent views of this court upholding freedom of expression in a long line of decisions. Then we have freedom of expression on the internet where fake news has been found to be a major problem. There was a set particularly a troubling section of the Information Technology Act, which made even <coughs> grossly offensive or uh, speech causing inconvenience, danger, obstruction, insult, and so on, illegal. But the Supreme Court struck down that particular section. The legal framework is not only permissive, it ought also to protect the media from threats of those wanting to silence it. Such threats may come from militant and insurgent groups as in Kashmir or Northeast or the Maoist affected areas. The media is not immune to criticism, but at times parties or forces connected with the ruling establishment indulge in anti-media rhetoric that not only inhibits the free functioning but more insidiously, it also undermines public faith in the media. Compliance with law is one of the, bas under the basic minimum required of the media. Beyond the legal realm lies the area of moral responsibility and responsible, that is responsible journalism. <coughs> and there are several <coughs> journalism professors and theorists who had listed the basics of good journalism, basically the commitment to truth, verification, independence, and then uh, playing a watchdog role effectively, speaking truth to power, and so on. These are well-known rules of responsible journalism. And uh, often, if a, a journalist is responsible or the publication is responsible, the courts also tend to take a very uh, benign or good view, even if it, it turns out to be 
somewhat inaccurate. Good journalism demands that first news and advertisements should be clearly separated and second, that news and opinion should be clearly demarcated in the media. <coughs> its virtue lies in the integrity, honesty, and objectivity of the journalists. The Indian media is by and large diverse and vigorous and serves the people well. At times, though, we can see the standards being violated, as for instance, in television, news shows, or the newspaper headlines. A more insidious development has been the phenomenon of paid news where advertising that is paid for masquerades as news. Typically it happens at the time of elections where it is doubly harmful. In the first place, it often masks the fact that the candidate written about has paid for it and keeps it out of his election expenses. Secondly, it misleads the readers in the, by presenting a candidate's own puffery about himself as objective news. The election commission in the most recent the ongoing election has formed teams to detect paid news by candidates and seek their explanation on expenses. Broadly, coming to the third aspect, of the freedom and responsibility, the accountability. Accountability also demands an agency that judges <coughs> content and penalizes transgressions. Professions like law, medicine, and account accountancy are regulated by statutory bodies that have powers to discipline members. Should journalism be regulated likewise? While there are some countries that license journalists, the clear answer in a liberal democracy is no, as journalism is tied to the basic right of freedom of expression. It has no entry barriers in that anyone can write or express himself, herself in the media, and there are no qualifications prescribed. There are broadly two approaches in America. The law is set, uh, let, sets the boundaries and leaves the rest to the good sense of the media. In Europe and elsewhere, a self-regulatory framework is also prescribed to ensure that the media function, or media are accountable to some external uh, authority. In India, there is a legislative framework for both the print media and for television. The press council, though it's created by statute, acts more like a self-regulatory body in that 20 out of its 29 members are drawn from the media. It's headed by the Supreme Court judge, includes five members of parliament and three other, three other representatives, but 20 of the 29 members are from the media. And in addition, it has no penal powers beyond censuring and ordering of publication of his rulings. Broadcasting Television is subject, however, to broadcast codes and advertising codes, and there is an electronic media monitoring center of the government of India that records all content of television stations, and transgressions of the code can result in stations being ordered off the air for specific periods as well. In addition, the television industry is also set up self-regulatory bodies for both news and for non-news channels. In the overall context, the Indian media is functioning freely and vigorously, though there are some problem areas such as criminal defamation and sedition. <coughs> there are in addition some uh, anti-media rhetoric by persons in authority that tends to inhibit free media functioning. And there are, there are also aberrations such as paid news and battles of television. But overall, it seems to have served the 
nation well, diverse with different voices and a multiplicity of viewpoints, though the quality of journalism needs much to be improved. With highly educated, idealistic youth coming into the profession in larger numbers from universities such as Jindal Global University, the future looks bright for the Indian media. Few occasions can compare with the excitement of working in a newsroom. Word that the Nobel Prize winning writer, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, who started life as a journalist, described as the best job in the world. 